All right, good evening, everyone. All right, so you can continue to eat your cheesecake. It's delicious cheesecake, as many of you have already noticed. Um, but uh, we're going to go ahead and go uh, move on to the next uh, part of this evening, the last speaker for today. And um, I'd like to introduce him. So um, Major General Paul Stanton assumed duties as the commanding general of the U.S. Army Cyber Center of Excellence in Fort Gordon on 30 June 2021 after serving as the Deputy Commanding General, U.S. Army Cyber Command at Fort Gordon, Georgia. He graduated from this institution, West Point, in uh, 1995 and was commissioned into the infantry. He transitioned into the cyber branch in 2015. Um, he's earned three degrees in computer science, a bachelor's degree from the United States Military Academy at West Point, a master's degree from the United University of Illinois, and a doctorate from the Johns Hopkins University. Now, uh, I'd like to um, just give a personal uh, note here about um, uh, General Stanton. When I was at Fort Meade, uh, I, I knew of, of Major Paul Stanton at the time because I think he was, he taught here in EECS as one of his assignments. And, uh, and I go over there and um, there's one, one day I, I went to his office, I think I was actually walking with him up there. And I, I, I normally take the elevators, but I'd learned quickly that uh, uh, General Stanton does not like elevators very much, so um, we quickly double-timed it up to the fourth floor in Ops 2B, I think, and uh, he looked at me and said something like, um, wow, we just got like a free workout, and I was like, I've never thought of it that way, but <laughs> that, that is one way to think of it, so next time you go up the stairs, you're getting a free workout. Um, so uh, we, we, we had a discussion at one point about um, you know, what we're going to be doing in the Army. I think he was a lieutenant colonel at the time, and then I, uh, he, uh, he and I discussed. I said, well, I'm thinking about going back to teach at West Point, but I haven't found a graduate school. And he's like, oh, he's like, what are you thinking of doing? I was like, ah, I don't know, like data stuff, vis visual um, stuff. He's like, oh, you got to meet this guy, Randall. And I was like, I don't know who Randall is. So we um, uh, went and had Vietnamese food, I think, down in D.C., and, and I met uh, Randall Burns, Dr. Randall Burns, who is a, a Johns Hopkins uh, computer scientist. And, uh, and sure enough, that's how I met my PhD advisor. Now, what I, I, I remember going home thinking, you know, I could do this. And I told my wife, this is going to suck. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that following in, in, in uh, Colonel Stanton's shoes of trying to do a, a computer science PhD on an Army timeline is probably, uh, probably going to be rough. So um, fast forward a few years later, I'm sitting in uh, um, Hackerman Hall, and there was the computer science uh, uh, chair came out and said, you know, we've got a problem. It takes about 6.7 6 years to um, graduate a computer science PhD at Johns Hopkins, and that's just too long. And so I'm looking there, and I'm sitting next to Randall Burns, my advisor, and as, as we looked at this chart, it has all the people that were at the, the six-year mark, but as we go to the left, there's this one dot and it, it was three years. And he's like, that's Paul Stanton. And I was like, holy crap. So um, with that, I will pass it over to General Stanton, who is the first, as far as I can tell, Johns Hopkins graduate of computer science and the Whiting School of Engineering that could pull it off in three years. So thanks, sir. I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, yes, I'm, I am definitely mic'd up because my voice is not that loud. I'm not going to get on the stage because I'm told that I have to stay within the bounds of the speakers, but I'm going to just float around a little bit. Um, I did not know that story. <laughs> I appreciate you embarrassing me if I don't know if my, my face is red or not. Um, but uh, it, Colonel Hamilton and, and I, are, are we do have some history. Um, and when he sent me a note uh, a couple months ago and said, uh, we're looking for a keynote speaker um, at, our, uh, at our conference, here's what the audience is, here's what the class of 1970 has set up, um, do you think you have time? No, but I'll make it. Because it's that important to have an opportunity to, to talk to this amazing group of current and future leaders. So let me first say thank you to the class of 1970, to 
Mr. John Collins uh, and, and uh, Mr. Frank Monaco, uh, Colonel Retired Frank Monaco. His son and I went to high school together. And you know, there, there's like six degrees of separation for all you data scientists out there, right? Um, it, that uh, that we, we had an enjoyable dinner of catching up. Uh, but thank you to the class of 1974. The concept of putting an entire cohort of our cyber leaders in one room. And yes, we can include our midshipmen. Because yeah. they are valuable members of the team. You heard about five times today that cyber is the ultimate team sport. You're gonna hear me say it probably about five or six more times during the course of the next half hour or so. Let me say thank you to the Army Cyber Institute for putting this together. A lot of thought, time, and energy goes into the coordination. Things like doing an icebreaker last night. And then when I walked up and did a, a quick discussion with many of you through the course of the day, you were talking to people that you had just met. That's a huge part of the point because this absolutely is a team sport. Because what we do is so challenging there's absolutely no way that you can be the expert in all of it. You have to be good, but you can't be the expert in everything that we need our cyber forces to understand and know how to execute. The folks that are in this room, your cohort, will be your friends and your colleagues for the rest of your lives. whether you stay in uniform or not. Because the bonds that you make through the challenges that you'll face, you'll learn how to depend on each other in very powerful ways. And God forbid we need you to do it in combat, that bond is unbreakable. So you're in a powerful setting that is setting the conditions for your future in uniform and out. Quick thank you to the officers that are in the room with us tonight. You start to really date yourself when you see your former students being, being <laughs> off, uh, the, in, the uh, speakers in a panel. Um, but I also have to say that I'm pretty proud of the fact that that folks that I had had the opportunity to work with, whether they were in my class or not, um, I recognize many uh, from my time when I was on the faculty here at West Point. Um, and let me tell you that we picked the right folks to come up here and provide operational expertise and a step closer to what you're gonna be doing in the near term. I mean, it's great you get the, the generals to walk around. We're old, right? And we're a, a more than a step removed from uh, company grade leadership that you'll be executing in the near term. So I appreciate uh, the, the officers, the NCOs, the warrant officers that are dedicating their time to come up and offer their, their perspective. It's not lost on me, I'll just be clear. No one remembers the guest speaker at these things. Like literally no one does. Um, a, a benefit is that you've already had chow um, you know, it, it, was, it was good food all day. Again, thank you to the class of 1970 uh, for putting on uh, a, a great spread. But you never remember, remember the guest speaker. You can know me as like answer number 10 on, your, uh, on the, the survey from last night, the scavenger hunt, right? Um, but like, whether or not you, you know who I am, um, I might run into you on Barton Field when you're down at Fort Gordon next year, so watch that. Um, and a notable exception uh, to the, the guest speaker is uh, Brigadier General Vile, um, who uh, masquerades as the cyber commandant. He's really a Mill Art P um, at, at, at West Point. Um, but, but think back to the message that he delivered. What has changed in the past 100 years in the execute of the fight is what you are responsible for. That's huge. And what a poignant exclamation point on his talk with the idea of taking our enemies back to 1919. 
based off what you are going to be able to do when you join the force next year. That's right around the corner. Hey, so you won't remember me. You won't remember much about my message. But I'm going to keep it simple as a result. Be a leader. What do I need from you? What do I want from you? What do I expect of you? Be a leader. There'll be a test at the end of this. See if you can keep pace. One of the most critical aspects of leadership, and specifically leadership in the military, and even more specifically leadership in the United States Army, I like to refer to it as the trust continuum. You must demonstrate competence. You heard some of our leaders talk about it earlier today. You must demonstrate competence. If you don't, your soldiers, the civilians that work with you, will sniff you out in a heartbeat. You demonstrate competence to earn their respect. We're a disciplined army. We're a disciplined joint force. You will get respect from your subordinates based off the rank that you have on your chest or your shoulders, wherever you're wearing it on, what, what uniform you have on. They will offer you that respect, but you have to earn their respect as a human being and as a leader. That's earned. And it's earned through your demonstrated competence. When your soldiers see that you know what you're talking about, they will follow you. When they trust that you will, one, know what you're talking about, and two, deliver guidance and orders in an ethical and moral manner, you will earn their trust. If likewise, your subordinates demonstrate their competence and they live ethically and morally, that trust becomes bi-directional. And that is what makes our army the best army in the world. We can execute through commander's intent and execute mission command. I can let you execute through disciplined initiative because there's mutual trust between you and your subordinates. Our, no other army in the world can operate like the United States Army in that regard. Disciplined initiative through mission command. But you have to be a leader to get to that point. Competence, you heard Major Major, I can't get over saying that, Keith, I'm going to keep doing it. You heard Major Major earlier today talk about technical competence. And you heard Jason DeCourcy talk about what it means to be a tool developer and how you have to have skills. Absolutely the case. You are a special group. For every one of you that's in the, the room tonight, there were 10 more that wanted the seat that you're in. We don't have a problem recruiting officers that want to become cyber officers in our army. You earned the seat that you're in. How many stripes are on the shoulders on the uniforms in this room? How many stars are on the collar? I know what that means. I can read the room. I know who's in here. I also know that General Vile and his team recruited you and have been talking to you for a couple years because we need the best and brightest. You passed that test. Congratulations. Now wrap yourself in a warm blanket of confidence and get ready to get to work. Because you must be a self-directed learner. In order to be technically competent in the cyberspace warfighting domain, you must be a self-directed learner. The rate of change of technology and the rate of change of our enemies and our adversaries is too great. What you know today will not be what you need for tomorrow. 
We must continue to learn. You must continue to learn. It'll change by the time you finish Bolick. It'll change by the time you get to your first unit of assignment. You got to stay on top of your game. However, back to my first point about who's in this room, your cohort. You cannot be an expert in everything. You have to understand, as an officer, the entire warfighting domain. But you can't be an expert in networking, in forensic analysis, in big data analytics, and the list goes on. You have to know who's in this room with you, that who has that expertise, so that when you need to phone a friend, you know where to find her or him. And then you have to bring your game. Collectively, we have to work together. You may be an expert in routing, and you may have studied the Cisco command line, and you got it down, and, and you're, you're hot on how to configure a router. Do you know how to configure a Huawei router? Do you know what the firmware inside the Huawei router looks like? Do you know what happens when you issue a command, how it operates on the inside? I'm not asking Jason, he probably does. You have to be a self-directed learner. You have to be humble to recognize that you won't know everything and you must lean on each other to develop that technical competence and expertise. that's not good enough either. Forgive me for the midshipmen in the room, but when you graduate next year, it says U.S. Army on your chest. So you must be a technical professional and you must demonstrate your competence. But don't ever forget that you're an Army professional. And with that comes expectations. I expect you to know your troop leading procedures, as discussed earlier this afternoon. I expect you to understand the military decision making process. I expect you to understand the vernacular of our war fighting forces. If you are a technical expert and you can't effectively communicate to a war fighting maneuver commander, you're no good to me. You've got to be able to communicate it. A great idea that you can't communicate is not a great idea. And we have a community inside of our profession that expects you to communicate using the terms of our profession. We cannot have a three-star general sit on a conference panel and talk about dolphin speak. That's not okay. It's on us to be able to take a highly technical topic, incredibly complex, and put it into words and concepts and visualizations that our community can understand. That's when we become effective. Think about the inverse. What happens the first time the battalion commander asks the 17 Alpha in the formation something about cyber, and that 17 Alpha doesn't have the slightest idea. You're instantly marginalized. And how many 17 Alphas, remember the charts from earlier today, how many 17 Alphas are in the formation out there with the infantry and armor and field artillery battalion commanders? You're it. You're alone and unafraid as the representative of understanding our warfighting domain to the rest of the Army. If you're marginalized, guess what happens in that leader's eyes? Cyber is shut down. 
I asked a cyber question to the cyber expert. That expert couldn't answer it. I don't have time for this. I'm going back to the map board, and I'm getting ready to go shoot, move, and communicate, salute, turret, and engage targets. And that is not OK, because our maneuver forces will die in combat, in large-scale combat operations, without your support. Remember what happened over the last 100 years? What's changed is what you're responsible for. The enemy can see you on the battlefield. MVO FM 3.0 says you must operate under constant observation. It is not OK for the maneuverist to ignore what you have to say. So be able to express it in terms that resonate with the maneuver commander. And don't be timid and shy about it. Be a leader. Walk into the command post with your chest up like you know what you're talking about, because you do, and then effectively communicate it to that commander in terms that he or she understands. That's being professionally competent. Put those two pieces together. You've got to be technically competent. You have to be an Army professional. Be a leader. You have to figure out how to put the pieces together such that you, as company-grade officers, can build the teams of the future. You will show up to a formation, and you will have NCOs and warrant officers and civilians that have been on those teams for years. 25% of the formation, as General Vial told you this morning, already have degrees. They're past you already. And they've got operational experience. You have to step in and lead that formation. But wait a minute. If you're going into an infantry platoon, hasn't that NCO also been there for years with tons of experience? Yeah, it's not that different. It's not that different with a notable exception of the technical expertise that no one individual can master all of it. So when you walk in to lead your small unit, you need to understand who your people are, what their skills are, what they bring to the team, and then you have to be the leader to build the team. Someone on that team is going to be a network expert. Someone is going to be a host analyst expert. Someone is going to be a data analyst. Your job as an officer is to be able to understand how to build a team effectively to achieve mission outcomes. And to take care of your people, understand who they are on a personal level, as was explained to you earlier this afternoon, such that you can inspire them to their life's best performances. That's what being a leader in this space is about. Giving them the opportunity to demonstrate their expertise, but harnessing it into an organized unit to achieve an effect. Recognizing that you're not going to be able to do it on yourself, recognizing that you're going to have those dependencies, recognizing and having humility and that you're going to have dependencies. But as several folks have said earlier today, your future is bright. Congratulations on having earned a seat in this room. Congratulations on what you've demonstrated to date. Now harness that, turn it into effective leadership. Be a leader. Thanks.
All right. So last night we had this uh, challenge that everybody participated in, which was awesome. And we have some winners for it. So the winning team is Blueberry Grunt, which is Seth Benson from USMA and Brendan Ward from the University of Akron. Come on up. Yeah, so you know six degrees of separation? It's a small world. So Cadet Seth Benson's dad, Colonel Jason Benson, was Lieutenant Jason Benson next to Lieutenant Paul Stanton back in 126 Infantry in Schweinfurt, Germany back in the day. So it's truly a, a small world, but it's my distinct pleasure to offer you both coins from the Cyber Center of Excellence on behalf of myself, my Command Warrant Officer, and the Command Sergeant Major. Uh, b based on your ability to solve problems dynamically in the middle of the fight. Cool. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. I'd like to present a gift to uh, General Stanton for his, uh, his great words tonight, inspirational, motivational as always. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it, Stephen. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, I do have one last, um, uh, I have an ACI coin to give to, uh, to someone here. So there was one more challenge on there, and um, we, didn't have a, we didn't have somebody who finished first on that one. We had one person that finished that one. So um, to those of you who don't know Base64 or um, encrypted ELF files and how to run them, um, go figure that one out. Um, to the one who does is... Um, Ted uh, Sikorsky, come on up. And I did forget to mention, he's actually from Johns Hopkins again, so talk oh. about the separation. He's, there we go. Okay, so um, that's all for tonight. I have um, just some admin notes for tomorrow. Uh, first of all, you need to be checked out at the Thayer before uh, tomorrow's session. So if you're going to be here at breakfast, you need to be checked out when you, when you get up in the morning, check out, get all that done. Um, there will be a place for you to store your luggage there. Um, and uh, same time as today, 7.30, the Thayer will have uh, the luggage room, and then after the sessions, um, we'll, buses will go back to the Thayer Hotel. There will have, you will have about 15 minutes to change, so good um, dressing drills going on uh, when you get back there, because um, the buses are gonna depart at 1300. There will be some room set aside so you can uh, change there uh, before you get off. So just keep that in mind that you're gonna have a short amount of time once you get back. Uh, with that, uh, have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow morning.